Rob was born with a flare pen in each hand. <laughs> Drawing precociously at age three, he fell in love with the comic strips Peanuts and the Flintstones. His mother, Dot, knew that Rob had an artistic gift and she encouraged him. Early on, he began to dream of a career as a professional cartoonist and knew that he had the ability to make it happen. But it was Chris Wagner, his art teacher at Shipley, who not only recognized his talent, but introduced him immediately to the harsh reality that natural ability wasn't enough to guarantee success in a competitive world. The key was hard work. Armed with what he had learned, Chris's mentorship and constantly hearing his mother's supportive voice in his head, Rob bore down, driven by such a fierce, never wavering ambition to pursue his dream that the many obstacles that faced him and knocked him back so regularly were not about to undermine his faith, his confidence, and his conviction. At last, the hard work and his exuberant self-promotion paid off. In 1989, his nationally syndicated strip, Jumpstart, was born, and it has endured as one of the most popular comic strips in the country, running daily in over 300 newspapers, including the Inquirer, and as of a month ago, the Philadelphia Daily News. Jumpstart succeeds because it is suffused with Rob's humanity and his universal values. As one of the few syndicated African-American cartoonists, Rob has been aware of the challenges facing minority artists, and he knows that his message to the public has to be carefully crafted. He wanted it to go beyond race, and by all accounts from his many admirers, his creation of a black middle-class couple working two jobs and raising four children is a typically American story. In the words of Charles Schultz, his, uh, a fan of Rob's from the early days, he said, Rob Armstrong populates his comic strip with great, well-drawn characters, and that is the whole thing. Rob's book has 20 short chapters, each of which has three components entitled, number one, The Drawing Lesson, number two, My Life, a memoir of his adventures and observations, and number three, Life Lesson, a brief summarizing homily on what it all means. A reader can get a taste of Rob's second career as a motivational speaker for young people by pondering the simple truths expressed in this book. Finally, for the last few years, Rob has been applying his outsized imagination and healthy ego to the conquest of Hollywood, where he now lives, the land of mirrors and illusions. He has been pushing the ideas of jumpstart the TV series, jumpstart the movie, and jumpstart the Broadway musical. <laughs> Over the top, to be sure, but remember this, Rob Armstrong can leap tall buildings and climb the highest mountains. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to introduce you the one and only, the fearless, Rob Armstrong. Now, we've got tonight, it's, um, it's a little scary, actually. This is kind of like my entire life, I'm just seeing a little bit of it in everyone's face. It's so beautiful. Really, and I hope this is not the end, which is kind of how it feels. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote a book, and then that was it. Um, I hope you guys all um, enjoy uh, Fearless. Hope you all buy Fearless, first of all. Uh, second of all, hope you all read it and enjoy it. I want you to go back, back to it over and over and just use this book to achieve whatever it is you're, you're trying to achieve. Sometimes your purpose isn't a career thing. Sometimes your career is actually over. Um, there are a lot of retired people, because like, if you're a friend of mine, you're, you're old. If you've known me for a long time, you know, you're old. Some people here are retired, but it doesn't mean your purpose, you know, it, your, your life's purpose is the thing that is you. It's that thing that's you. And that's kind of the reason I wrote this book. I wanted you to find your purpose, no matter who you are. And um, I've been extremely blessed to have gotten here with the help of many people. And... Uh, and I've reached incredible um, uh, uh, heights in life due to the help of, of others. I'm greatly aware, I'm, I'm appreciative and fully aware that I would not be here without the help of certain people. I don't have time to mention every, everyone. My wife is right here. Can you do me a favor real quick, Crystal? Get rid of that. That's just, just turn that off. And I, have, I have a lot of people 
emailing me and texting me. They, they couldn't make it. That's their thing. I can't, can't make it. Sorry. <laughs> There's a lot of that going on. Uh, I want to thank Andy for having me here and everybody involved with the Free Library. Uh, there are very accomplished writers who would, um, who would literally sever a pinky or a toe or something to come and do this. And the fact that they chose me to do this, I'm very humbled by it. So thank you so much. Um, I'm assuming everyone here has seen Jumpstart before. Uh, if not, shame on you. <laughs> but these are the characters from Jumpstart. Um, I've been drawing and writing Jumpstart now for 27 years. It's been running um, in daily and Sunday. Not every comic you see runs daily and Sunday, but Jumpstart's been running daily and Sunday for uh, 27 years. These are the, the characters that some of you may be familiar with. You, oh, good. There you go. <laughs> One person is like, gotcha. That's Joe from Jumpstart. Thank you. This is Joe and his wife, Marcy, from Jumpstart. It's a joy for me to write this strip. Like, I've been doing it just long enough where the people who syndicate Jumpstart, my editor, uh, they're in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, actually. I've been doing this just long enough where they think that, um, that I hate it, you know? <laughs> it's like, you're going to retire, aren't you? It's like, what? No. Why? Why would I retire from them? I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm just getting started. Like, I'm just getting started. Jumpstart is finally, like, the characters I've come up with are starting to now talk to me. Instead of me always talking for them. It sounds crazy. Because it is. Like, they're, they're, these are all imaginary characters. There's no one real in Jumpstart. They're imaginary characters, and they are now speaking to me every day and every night. And uh, for a cartoonist, it's like a great relief to get to this point where it's, it's weird. And like, there's like, I have a great idea for next week. I'm like, I'm listening. What are you saying? <laughs> I'm all ears. My wife is in bed going, honey, should I call the people? <clears throat> the people, she threatens to call. Joe and Marcy. I mean, they're more than just cartoon characters, obviously. I mean, to me, and I hope to you. I hope they represent something, they represent marriage and love. And all the characters around them represent marriage and love. I am no stranger to these concepts. I'm looking out here, and like I'm the recipient of a lot of love. Thanks to, thanks to these guys. There's Nate here and Jim from I, I do a, a summer program I speak at every year called PFEW, and, um, and I've been doing it for a long time, like 22 years, and it's what's gotten me really into public speaking, actually. And the two guys from PFEW here, I can't believe it. I don't know where these guys even came from. I don't know. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And my family is here. The clothiers and the herdics are here. My family, my Aunt Carmela is here. This is just, I'm the recipient of love, and my characters seem real and jumpstart because they too represent what love is all about. That's what the comic strip is really all about. Um, I'll draw the rest of the characters real quick. This is the, the, the main group. Joe and Marcy have four kids and uh, this, is, uh, this is Sonny. And Sonny is based on my real life daughter, uh, Tess. In fact, when Sonny was born, um, it was just after my real life daughter, Tess, was born. And so, so Sunny is actually, if you read the strip, you know, she seems to be a little girl about 10 or 11 years old in Jumpstart. But she's in real years the same age as, as Tess, and Tess is now 22. So Sunny is like 22 years old. And the same thing with um, like JoJo, like back in those days, I would experience something in life, and I would put it right into my comic strip. I don't really do that anymore, because my real life is, like, my real life is more tumultuous than people want to read about. Like no one wants to, to read about divorce. You know what I mean? Like, you know what I'm saying? We read the funnies. You know, you're reading Peanuts and Beetle Bailey. You, you don't want to know about divorce. And, 
you know, you just want to pretend that doesn't even happen, you know. So my real life took a turn, actually, around 2003, 2002. When I went through that, um, I started to be a little more creative. I had to dance around the fact that I was going through it, right? And then I met my second wife. I met my second wife. My life took a real, another huge turn for the better. But I realized, like, I had to, I had to invent more fictitious things in Jumpstart and make them seem real. And that's around the time I invented the twins. I brought the twins into Jumpstart um, around the time I was rediscovering life, when I experienced um, a new birth after I met Crystal. Like, I, we've never had any real twins. Thank God, right? <laughs> it was never happening. But Jumpstart suddenly had a, pre a very pregnant Marcy, and inside of her were two shapes. And they took on personality and character. I decided to give the twins a voice inside the womb. You remember that? That, that was crazy. The best thing about being a cartoonist, by the way, is you can do whatever you want. Like, my syndicate never says no. They don't care. All they care about is having the strip delivered on time. That's their number one concern. Like, where is it? It's coming. It's got twins inside the womb, and they're in the fetus. They're, they're just talking to each other. It's fetuses. Fine. Send it. <laughs> Quickly. They don't care. It's green light. And that's when I invented Teddy and this character Tommy. This is Teddy. But in the beginning, I'm drawing their faces now. I don't have a lot of time to walk you through all of it. But Teddy and Tommy are fraternal twins, right? And, you know, Tommy's got the hair and he doesn't. That's how you know one from the other. And totally made up, like totally fictitious. And this is around 2005, 2004. So even they would be like 11 years old. But if you know that, if you read the strip, they're still crawling around babies. I'm going to keep them like that. That's because it's funnier. It's funnier. They can say more. They can be a little more um, outrageous because they're so innocent. See, the characters are freer when they're babies. They allow me to get into more areas. I mean, right now, they're like, you'll see this in the next few weeks. I'm not sure when. Right? I'm working way ahead of, when you read something in Jumpstart, I've done it months and months ago. So what you read right now, I've actually created it about two months ago. So what I'm writing right now, you're not going to see it until like June. But I'm dealing with like the fact that they think they're in a secret society together. <laughs> I won't use any words, any names. You know what I'm talking about. It's secret society. And they're talking about that. They, they got a handshake. You know what I mean? They, they're designing a logo. They allow me to do all kinds of crazy things. All of my characters allow me to express different parts of myself that are socially, uh, you know, it, it, unacceptable. <laughs> right. I mean, look at this guy. Crunchy is Joe's partner, for example. And uh, he is never happy. He's in a perpetually bad mood. And Crunchy allows me to write the strip when I'm in a bad mood. Like sometimes I'm in a really bad mood. I can always focus on Crunchy and what he's up to. So Crunchy actually got married not long ago. And it's a strange marriage. So, so whenever my marriage feels awkward or strange, rather than argue with my wife about it, I write about Crunchy and his marriage. He married his captain. He married a woman who tells him what to do. So rather than me commenting on that same thing happening to me in my house, <laughs> I write about him. All my characters like that. They all give me freedom. They all give me um, an appreciation for life and marriage and family that I would not ordinarily have if I didn't have this career. I'm telling you, it's an incredible 
career. There's no way in the world I would have this book fearless if my life was simple or easy. I do a lot of speaking at schools, and sometimes I meet kids who want an easier life. You know, their, their reality is just too hard or whatever. In the early years when I was um, invited to speak, the very first time I was invited to speak, by the way, I was um, talking to my friend David Brown. How many people in here know David Brown? Everybody knows David Brown. Yeah, of course. David Brown's family is here somewhere. There they are. So David Brown, oh my goodness, Linda's here? I didn't even see you said She's scared me. What's up? Right? The whole Brown things right here. So years ago, he's real well known. Like David's, is David's wife is right? See, I knew it. Look, boom, there you go, boom. That's Sharon Brown. Where's Dave at? He's partying? Okay, he better come on. I'm about to talk about it. Just tell him what I said. You know what? Don't tell him what I'm about to say about him. So David Brown invited me to speak to a group of kids. He invited um, me and I guess some politicians and stuff to address an adopted class. This was back in, this was about 23 years ago, something like that. And, and it happened to be the classroom where I was a second grader. I didn't know it when I said I'd do it. In fact, when I said I'd do it, I immediately, I, I immediately regretted saying I would do it because speaking is a pain in the neck. It happens right in the middle of an ordinary work day. I had a normal job. I was working at the time for a terrible boss. Would you please stand up? Where's my terrible boss? Where's Victor? Victor still? Would you stand up for a second? I was working for this guy. <laughs> Him. And uh, just awful. Victor was a very talented dude, actually. Very talented. But he was more swept up in his own talent than he was caught up in my talent. And I was a junior art director. He was my creative director. My job was doing like drawings and stuff that he would think of the idea and he would tell me to just draw it and shut up, you know. <laughs> His thing was that he would always say, I hired you for your wrist. What are you talking for? What are you talking about? So I have an idea for the client. Maybe you show him your idea, slip in my idea. You know what time it is. Just draw. Just draw. And I was working in this little closet right across from him. It was awful. It was a closet. It wasn't a small office. It was a closet across from his office. Am I making this up? It was no. a. <laughs> they moved a fi like some files out of there and moved me in. And he would just yell across the hall. Well, David Brown said, uh, "Come out, you know, 20 minutes on your lunch hour and speak to these kids." <laughs> so I lied to Victor and said uh, I was sick. I don't know what, I, I had to get out for the rest of the day. You, speaking is not a fast thing. And I went to the school, and I spoke to these kids, and I realized that when I spoke, and I drew pictures, and I was honest about my life that began when I was their age in that very same room. It was eerie. I knew that my life and my life's experience, no matter how horrible, had importance had meaning, and they could change a person. It could motivate anyone, because these little kids sat there and were well-behaved. <laughs> that's the thing with little kids. You just say something, and they won't talk back. Like, that's it. You got it. And when I finished speaking, the teacher said, oh, my goodness, um, I've never seen any of them sit in one spot like that. Like you, I think you've got a special gift. Would you mind speaking at Shoemaker? My sister's a principal there. You should go there and speak to the whole school. And I said, I don't know, Shoemaker? Do you guys remember Shoemaker circa 1987? Right. Like they based the whole show on it. It's called Cops. <laughs> it's just awful. I was like, I don't know. But I said, OK, I do it. I went to Shoemaker, and I spoke. And I realized that no matter how rebellious kids are, no matter how raucous the environment, if I just drew pictures, spoke honestly, kids would listen. 
And I realized I had a career. And I started speaking at libraries and stuff. And it was, it was an amazing change in my life. Now, what am I speaking about? Why are these kids leaning in like this? What's happening in front of that classroom? What's happening is I'm experiencing a cathartic. And I'm speaking in front of kids. And this, be, by the way, turned into adults and, and, and college age kids. And every, I speak to corporations now. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We all have uh, a crisis, struggle. One thing that unites everybody is everybody suffers in life, everybody. And there's a connection I was able to make that began with kids because I simply told them that when I was their age, I couldn't draw like this. I couldn't. What I tell them is that when I was their age, my drawings didn't look like anything. I would watch TV and I would try to draw the stuff other people came up with, cartoons from television. And of course, kids relate to that. They go, that's what I do. I say, yeah, I copied off TV. I used to watch the Flintstones and I would try to draw Fred Flintstone. I was three years old and Fred didn't come out looking exactly like the Flintstones. Fred came out looking like this. That was supposed to be his head <laughs> and his nose. And one eyeball was over here. The other eyeball was out here. It just, it's messed up. His mouth was all messed up. His body was too skinny. And kids like that. It's the truth, by the way. This is awful. <laughs> Had that tie on his dress, remember that? Spots. But his legs were too long and skinny. Feet were facing the wrong direction. Both feet going over here. Just <laughs> arms. When I was three, I thought his arms came out from his head. <laughs> it's crazy. And his, and his fingers, I couldn't even count fingers. I thought he had 19 fingers. <laughs> it's the worst thing I ever saw in my life. But my mother, Dot Armstrong, that's what changed my life. She, Take a look at that and go crazy. She come in the house and go, who did this one? And my brother, I have a brother named Mark Armstrong. He goes by Kabir Armstrong. Now David Brown walks in the room. I'm finished talking about you, bro. I had a whole thing about you, too. I mean, you missed it. <laughs> it's like, thank God I missed that. I've known Dave for a long time. I've known Dave, real quick, real quick, real quick. I'm going to come back to this. But when I met Dave, I was a little boy. And I lived in Winfield, right around West Philly. And I lived in the not nice part of Winfield. Dave lived in the nice part of Winfield. <laughs> you know why? Dave had a basketball, basketball court in his driveway. Well, he had, he had a driveway, first of all. <laughs> and he had a basketball court on top of that. And I didn't know him. I was next door neighbors to his cousin, Linwood. So Linwood would say, you want to go play some basketball? I'm like, yeah. We go to some dude's house. I was like, this is crazy. <laughs> he lives here? <laughs> yep. And we would play basketball, and he was just this little kid. He had a real nice game. He was like Stephen Curry. <laughs> but when you're growing up in the house with the court in the house, that's what happens. And I lost complete contact with Dave. We were grown men, and I was working at Spiro and Associates. Remember Spiro and Associates? Mike just went up. Really? When you talk to him? You're kidding. Oh, my goodness. Well, I worked there. Me and Dave worked at, at Spiro. I, in fact, I, worked, I was still in college. I was at Syracuse. I was working at Spiro as a free intern. They didn't pay me anything. Uh, they were worse to work for than Victor Della Barba. <laughs> because, at least he paid me. I was making $17,000 a year working for that dude right there. I had a 1983 Subaru working for, Dave, working for Victor Della Barba. I was working at Spiro and Associates. They didn't pay me anything. They loved it, just free labor. They got a movie about that, Django. <laughs> Unchained, <laughs> exactly. It was unbelievable. Huh? I got to talk about the book? I'm, I'm getting to the book. I'm here to sell as many books as I can, OK? I didn't forget. My wife told me I sell the book. Don't sell no Django Unchained. What's wrong with you? 
I saw David Brown in the bathroom at Spiro. So we, I was in the bathroom, and I just looked, and the dude with the driveway was washing his hands. I was like, what are you doing here? And I recognized because David Brown looks the same right now <laughs> as he looked back when he was Stephen Curry. <laughs> Said it hasn't changed. Really young then and young now, right? So he was like, hey, man, I work here. I was like, what? Are they paying you? Like, yeah, they're paying me. I'm like, they're not paying me. <laughs> it's just really not right, but I had a great experience at, at the thing. I, I'm, I'm going to get to the book. <laughs> yeah, my mom would, uh, look, I wouldn't even have a book if not for Dot Armstrong. She would praise this kind of level of, of cartooning to the point where it caused friction with in my family, because my brother had actual talent. <laughs> my brother could draw Fred Flintstone. In fact, he could do, that's all he could do. He couldn't even draw other things. He could draw Fred Flintstone, and it would look just like Fred Flintstone. I would do this, and she would say, who did this one? I was like, me! <laughs> you mean to tell me you drew this all by yourself? I was like, yup. I did this all by myself. She said, oh my god, I'm going to give you a star. That looks just like the ones on TV. I was like, wait a minute, Mom, I messed up. She was like, no, you didn't. I'm going to take this drawing to work and show everybody. I was like, his hair is supposed to be black, though. She was like, OK, color his hair in, and I'm going to take this to work. I was like, OK. You know how when you're three years old, you can't color inside the lines? I was like. Finished. <laughs> she said, oh my goodness, two stars for you. She said, Robin, listen, you forgot one important thing. You've got to write your name on that. I said, really, how come? She said, once you put your name on artwork like this, it's worth a lot of money. <laughs> I was like, that's right, my fault. You know how when you, you're three and you learn how to write letters, but you can't write small letters? I was like. <laughs> R. <laughs> like by the second letter, I'm off the edge of the paper, like, oh. No way to go but up, B. <laughs> B. Now I'm writing tinier and tinier. I and Robin. My actual name is Robin Armstrong, by the way. My cousin knows, knows that. Y'all don't know that. Y'all think my name is Rob. It's, I'm calling myself Rob. I got tired of being confused with a girl. <laughs> my wife calls you Robin, thank God. Buy the book. My time's almost up. Really? How much time I got? <laughs> Am I really out of time? Or are you saying I'm almost out of time? I can wrap up by two more minutes. Two minutes? All right. Well, listen. I got two minutes. I better draw a better Fred Flintstone. I know that. <laughs> but I practiced Fred Flintstone. That's what I'm trying to tell you. I practiced Fred because my mother liked it. She liked it and praised it. I drew Fred Flintstone every day for about 10 straight years, OK? I got extremely good at one thing like my brother. I was like, look. All I need is one thing, Fred Flintstone. <laughs> right? All my friends like, watch this guy, he draws a Flintstone. It's unbelievable. That <laughs> quick. That's all I could do. So my, um, I was growing up at that, I was at 56 and Walnut back then. And we lived not far from the elevated subway. And I had another brother, Billy, who was killed on that subway. My brother was caught between the doors of a moving train, torn into two. And he was an adventurous guy, a bigger than life character. And I write about uh, uh, Billy so extensively in, in this book that at first glance, you might think this book is, is a kind of a boastful title about my own courage or something. It's actually about Billy. And it's about Dot Armstrong. It's about my fearless family. Billy was not afraid of anything, including death. He was mutilated and didn't cry or react. 
He was a 13-year-old boy. And my mother decided to move us out of that neighborhood into a better neighborhood. And that's how I ended up in Winfield. Not the best part of Winfield, but I was in Winfield. And while living in Winfield, my brother Mark, the one who used to draw the Flintstone, he was attacked by the cops in the 70s. And it was awful. He was beaten, mistaken identity. And my mother was so uh, determined to have me spared that she started me into private school when I was 12. So it was in private school that my life took on uh, a new perspective, that my idea of family broadened. A lot of my family is now sitting here. Um, it's be, it's, it was that time when I realized that you know family uh, is someone who sacrifices for you. It doesn't matter what race someone is. If somebody loves you despite how you're treating them, that's family. They didn't love me because I was a nice kid. I mean, you know, they, they, they were like, look, you, you, we're about to forget all about you. Stop being so mean. I know you're hurt. Why was I so hurt? Why was I so difficult to like or love? Because it was at Shipley that my mother was diagnosed with cancer and passed away in her 40s. But I had family step into my life uninvited. We're going to help you. The herdics are sitting here. The clothiers are sitting here. All their children are here who embrace me like a brother and a sister. When I talk about fearlessness, sometimes you have to summon up a lot of courage in order to love somebody. That's the real sign of, of fearlessness. It's loving. Because you can't always get it back in return. It's very rare that you do, actually. So all of these accounts and all of these things and all these life experiences that some might want to forget. Some might not want to talk about the realities of the harsh realities of life. I've embraced these things. I've realized that they have sparked my creativity. They give me a place of solace, somewhere to go, some place I can control, whether it be a comic strip or whether it be writing this book. I actually uh, had to had made my mind up. I'm sorry, Andy. I had made my mind up because I'm over. I'm done. I had made my mind up to talk about the process of writing a book because it's really interesting, but I can't do it. <laughs> it's fascinating, trust me. Very, very interesting. Hard to do, by the way. Three-year odyssey uh, to write a book. And, and the, uh, the, end product, the end product is something that um, to say I am proud of it um, is an understatement. And, um, and I know what many people are searching for. I know my purpose, at least on one level, my purpose was to write that book, Fearless. And I want to thank, I want to thank you for having me. I want to thank all of you who made it out here. I love you all. I got to go. If some cartoonists uh, age their characters like Funky Winterbean, some never age like Beetle Bailey or right. those cartoons, you're somewhere in the middle. But was that a conscious decision that I'm going to freeze them in time? Because when I started reading it, it was Joe right. Cobb. Now I'm Frank Cobb. <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny. No, it's true. Um, I have decided to freeze my characters in time. Um, aging your characters is, um, is bad for business. <laughs> I'm serious. It's like people don't keep up with it enough. Like if they change too much suddenly, and people are changing, real people change fast. You know, if your characters are changing like a real person, it's too jarring. You want to build a connection with people that last the majority of your, your career and stuff. My question is relative to the motivational speaking that you do. Mm -hmm. Can you sum up for us and tell us the audiences that you speak to and just some of the subject matter on your motivational speaking because you're so sought after? Oh, my goodness. Okay. That was nice and succinct. Thank you. I was just teasing you. You don't talk too much. It's awful. So I speak mostly to high schoolers, the majority of my speeches. But I'm not limited to that. I'm speaking about overcoming adversity. I'm speaking about the value of trials and tribulations in life. There's a value to it, believe it or not. It's, just, it's not something you must uh, overcome or get past. And I, I'm not really past losing my brother. I'm not past my other brother getting beat by the cops. I'm not past the struggle my mother had to keep our family together and to inspire me and to get me to the right school. I'm not past any of it. I've used all of it. 
I believe that a blessed life is a life where you use all of your pain. I think you're actually cursed if your life is too easy. It's a strange curse to have. You don't want to be Justin Bieber. You don't want that. I wanted to know if there were um, ever any ideas that you had for your strip uh -huh. that um, the uh, syndicates frowned on or they rejected, they didn't want you to do. And did you do anything with them at all? Um, well, sometimes my strips are just stupid. It's not like I'm doing something that's like it's so controversial that they're not going to, they, they just react like, what is that? What do you, I don't get it. <laughs> it. That's stupid. Like, what are you doing? And I look at it and I go, you know, that is stupid. <laughs> I got to, I got to confess. It, they're not all gems. This hasn't happened in a long time, by the way. I've spent the last 15, I want to say the last 17 years not hearing a lot of negative reactions from my syndicate. Thank God. It's amazing because I don't work for them. I'm not at the syndicate. I'm at home in my underwear. <laughs> Sometimes not even that. <laughs> I did a thing where Joe got shot. It got me in trouble because Joe was shot a couple of years back in like 2010 or something like that. Joe was wearing a medallion that a homeless guy gave him. Like some guy, Joe gave a guy a meal on Thanksgiving, and he, hunt, he stalked Joe and found him and gave him a medallion, and Joe was forced to wear the medallion because he said he would, and he was wearing it, and some guy, some, some suspect just unloaded on him, and it hit him right in the medallion. But I didn't show that Joe lived. I just showed his bullet hitting him in the medallion. And that same day, like that same week, three police officers were murdered across the country. Like literally people reading about a murder of a police officer and seeing jump start with a, with a shot cop. So people were just livid. Just, you think that's funny? I, said, I, I did that like two months, I wrote that like two months ago. I mean, I didn't know this was gonna happen. And then I had to explain that Joe lives because some papers wouldn't run jump start again. Like the next day you see Joe, he's lived. He's like, oh, wow, this thing caught the bullet. Like the next day. But like some papers, some papers yanked jump start permanently. So only in my letter of apology was I able to communicate to some people in some cities that Joe actually lived and that this was a statement about paying it forward and the value of it, that some homeless guy saved his life. But it, it was an overreaction. I get it. it I, wasn't, I wasn't mad. My wife is mad, though. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the, pay, the, new, the Tacoma Daily Sun is never going to run your? I'm like, no. They're, they're furious. You know what I mean? But, so your question was, how do I draw pictures? That's a very good question. Here is the answer. It's an excellent question. I draw pictures because I'm able, I'm able to see the artist is not the person who draws. People think that's art. The artist is not the person who draws. The artist is an individual who's got a gift from God. And that gift allows the artist to see blank paper is blank to everyone except the artist. I'm able to see whatever I want on here. I can, I can see it. Just tell me anything, anything. Say draw a duck. I don't care what it is. Doesn't have to be jump start. Hurry, because I'm completely out of time. What do you want me to draw? I don't care what it is. I will see it, and then I will draw it. What is it? A duck, OK. <laughs> we worked that out outside. Huh? Look, I've never drawn a duck. I don't know ducks. I think they have a beak. So you start with the stuff you know. You know they have eyeballs, and you know they have, they have a beak, and you know they have a, a kind of a duck butt. <laughs> and that's not a good duck? Well, come up here and draw a better duck. That's not a good duck? Is the beak off? I mean, it's not Daffy Duck. It's a duck. That's why I saw a duck, and I, if you ask me how I do it, that's how I do it. That's what I saw. No, I couldn't draw. My mother said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be a cartoonist. She said, really? I was three. She said, oh, that's great. You're going to be a cartoonist. And she never stopped believing in that. No offense, but a lot of you have known me for a long time. None of you took me seriously. Except for my mother, like, literally. I'm, I was telling Victor Delabar, I was a grown man with a car to pay for. I was telling this guy, 
You know what I really want to do? What? I want to draw cartoons. Even he was like, cartoon. Like in the newspaper. Like Charlie Brown. You're talking about like Snoopy. That's what you want to do. I said, Victor, I'm t- I've got a gift. I've got a special calling to do cartoons. He was like, you got a special drawing to do the sketches in my brain. In the closet. Goom, what are you doing to me? He would call me Goomba. Goom, you're killing me here. What are you talking about? Everybody was like that. My own family was like that. People loved me. But the clothiers, this is a family who loved me. I said, listen, here's what I'm trying to do in college. And when I get to Syracuse, you know, I'm drawing cartoons. <laughs> you know, come on, it's ridiculous. But my mother, God rest her soul, was like, I love it. So when I experienced all the rejection that comes with trying to become a cartoonist, I could only hear the voice of my mother echoing. Now, I've heard your voices too. I mean, how are you going to forget this guy's voice? <laughs> but the voice of my mother is saying, yes, that makes, I like it. Right? I like it. Go, go for it. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. So rejection goes on for years. It's not like one letter or two letters or ten letters or twelve letters. It's, a ye- it's years and years and years of rejection before you get a comic strip into any newspaper, anywhere. It's just it's the, the, the need to believe beyond what people can see is a requirement for certain things in this world. And I had that level of belief in the Have you ever uh, stopped by the Palm restaurant for a snack? Oh my goodness, yes, I have with the cartoons everywhere. I have. The, 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 because because Victor they, took me to it. Go they're ahead. classified as cartoons or caricatures. What's the... Those are caricatures in the, in the I Palm. See. Yeah. I see. But literally, the first time I went to the Palm, Victor took me to the Palm. Yeah, he, he would take me to these places. Victor opened my eyes to stuff I didn't know. He would say, for example, don't wear penny loafers no more. So why? What's the problem with penny loafers? Goom. <laughs> Mouth for nothing. Bad enough you got penny loafers. To add insult to injury, you got pennies in them. <laughs> what are you doing? Are you, what are you so you know I me? caught the Maury Turner reference yes. in the cartoon a couple weeks ago. Yes. Yeah, uh, because I wrote you about that. Um, have you snuck others in that people, you know, only people who might know? I met, I met Liz at Maury Turner's 90th birthday. It was unforgettable. This guy lived to be 90, died shortly after turning 99. Who was Maury Turner? Without Maury Turner, I would also probably not be a syndicated cartoonist. He was the first black cartoonist, and he did a, com- a comic strip called We Pals, and he became a great mentor and great friend, um, a true genius, and even at 90, gone too soon. Am I right? You're talking about a great guy. I was just a kid when I called Maury Turner. I was, uh, I was at my very first advertising, I was at my second advertising gig, and the gig that we had together, the whole place went under. So I went, and Victor got me my next job. Like, I had lost my first job due to a closing of the business. And Victor got on the phone and said, pack up your stuff, goom, go across the street. And he sent me to go see this guy named Jer- Jerry DeRusso who hired me. And when I was working for Jerry, I called Victor Della Barba, I called uh, Maury Turner, I wish Maury was here. I wish Maury was here. I called Maury Turner because I got his number from a, a Daily News reporter, a guy named um, Rich Argood, editorial man, edi- uh, edi- uh, managing editor of the Daily News back then. Rich Argood said, call Maury Turner. I called Maury. I was so excited. I said, you don't know me. My name is Rob Armstrong. He said, do you know what time it is, Rob Armstrong? <laughs> I said, of course. It's 9 o'clock. I just got to the office. He said, I live in Sacramento, California. I had never been anywhere. I didn't know anything. I said, so what are you getting at? <laughs> he said, are you out of your mind? I just got up. You woke me up. I said, oh, I did? He said, it's 6 o'clock in the morning here. He said, I'll call you back, though. And he did. Maury called me back a half hour later, got himself together, became my friend over the phone, and remained my friend until his death. I am not kidding. My first contact with United Features Syndicate was through a Maury Turner contact with, uh, with Charles Schultz's editor. How many books have you wrote? Um, well, I've got one good one. <laughs> this one. 
Never mind the other ones. Okay, let's not talk about that. Why bring up sore subjects? Those books weren't that good. I can tell you that. I'll be honest with you. I didn't pour myself into those books. I didn't invest in those books emotionally. In fact, my first draft of this book was not invested in emotionally. My editor uh, got my first draft. I was very excited. Sent my first draft off. This is about two and a half years ago. I was very worked up. I said, there you go. That giant email that can't even fit into a regular email packet. Went into that drop box. I was like, there you go. She said, Rob, okay, for the, so the drop box, it came back, and literally the entire manuscript had a red line through it. <laughs> Fearless was called uh, something else. I don't even tell you what the title was. And she said, you, you can't, you, this, is, uh, this is no good. I said, well, I can see that. What's wrong with it? She said, you haven't invested emotionally in this book. And I thought to myself, wow, that's what happened the last eight times I've had. I've had like eight books in print. I got, if you just Google my name, you'll see all kinds of unbought books. <laughs> they weren't that good. Let's face it. They, would, they wouldn't be in that position if they were good. This, however, I'm not here for, for nothing. The, the, anybody who's seen this book can tell this is a whole different ball game. It's because I invested emo. She, my editor said, look, when people read your book, they have to know how you felt going through your life. Your first draft, I can't tell how you feel about things. You're too dispassionate. You're like a guy standing on a stage giving a presentation. I can't tell how you feel about things. Take a look at it and write the way you can write. And seven drafts later, like even the second draft was terrible. And the third draft was getting there, frankly. I was like, I thought I was there, around three. But that's about seven drafts away. Books are really, really, uh, uh, don't yeah, do I it. I wanted to ask you. Uh, a painter beyond belief. Where, where did you get your, your strip running in the first time? Um, okay, so, so Maury Turner made these connections for me. And I had been sending out my stuff for literally for years, like all through college and stuff. My first published work was in college. I did a strip for the school newspaper. I did a cartoon called Hector. Hector was really good. I mean, for a college strip. I'm, not, you know, I'm, uh, I, I'm serious. Ask my wife. It was, it was great. And Hector had a following. Like I, that was the first time I had a following. Like people like asking me about tomorrow's cartoon, and and people liked Hector, right? And I thought Hector would be syndicated, but Hector never. That's the only. You're the first ones to see Hector since 1985. <laughs> but but like syndicates had seen enough Hector and variations on Hector that they they sort of knew me. I spent years just sort of bothering them. And around the time that um, Maury Turner came into my life, you know, Hector had changed. He was a grown man. He had a job. He was a cop, actually, and all that. It wasn't like Jumpstart, but it was getting there. And my, um, the woman who discovered me, Sarah Gillespie, said, this latest incarnation you have with the, with the cops and everything, um, we, we like it. We like it enough to give you a development deal. So they, 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 they signed me to a contract. And they paid me $2,500. That was the whole contract. Like, that's the whole thing. That's not, a, that's not a, a signing bonus. That's the whole thing. But that was the only money uh, anyone ever gave me to draw cartoons, though. I was like, what? Twenty-five a check with a comma in it. So I did a deal with them that lasted about eight months or so. And within that eight-month period, they signed me to a full development deal. Just when they were about to, to sign me to that, they said, do you, um, do you have any, uh, do you know a lawyer? They said, do you, do you, do you know a lawyer? And, and I knew that one. <laughs> this one. <laughs> this is Cordy Clothier right here. I said, by golly, I do know a lawyer. And I dragged, I dragged Cordy Clothier to New York City, and we signed that first deal. That was in 1989, and they launched the strip known as Jump. I did not come up with the name Jumpstart, by the way. A woman at, uh, uh, at United Feature Syndicate came up with it. And when they were about to launch the strip under this name Jumpstart, I said, what is that Jumpstart, by the way? What is it? He said, that's the title of your comic strip. <laughs> I said, no, my strip is called Off Duty. I don't know if you noticed the last few submissions I sent is off duty. It's about a cop and a nurse when they're off duty, they're married. You get it? She said, no, we don't get it. <laughs> no one's going to like that. I said, well, 
No one's going to understand Jumpstart. I don't know what that means. What does it mean? She said, doesn't mean anything. <laughs> I said, wait, wait a minute. You mean to tell me I can't name my own comic strip? She said, Charles Schultz didn't name his. He wanted to call it Little Folks. We came up with peanuts, which also means nothing. <laughs> I said, sold. Because <laughs> that guy's got a blimp over every football game. Right? <laughs> Anything you say. So yeah, 40 newspapers launched it. And uh, uh, it stayed at 40. <laughs> I was in 40 newspapers. I was in 40 newspapers for like three years. Like then, it, I got interviewed a lot in those years. And, I think publicity helps. And then I was in like 60 newspapers for a long time. When you get to about 100 newspapers, you can think about retiring. In my case, I just got fired. You know, I was at 100 newspapers and I was never at work. I was like, I can't come in today. When you're doing a comic strip a lot, it affects your work life. And I, you know, I was let go from an ad agency. And I, at around 100 newspapers, I, I said, I can live, I can live off that. It's, it's, it's more than enough. That's every newspaper paying you every single month, every newspaper. So I, I focused on my career and started having kids and, and all that. And then my, you know, I, had ki I had two kids and realized that 100 newspapers wasn't enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Will not enough. Will we ever see Jumpstart on television? Ah, uh, no. <laughs> I came close. I had to deal with Fox. I had to deal with 20th Century Fox, the, the, the network, and I had to deal with I had to deal with 20th Century Fox, the studio, and I had to deal with Fox, the Fox Network, uh, up until January 2015. So the show we were developing got that far. It got really, really far. It got so far that everybody I, you know, a lot of my friends and people who know me real well and family were expecting to see that show on the following fall season, actually. And I had to, I had to sort of unring a bell, not a pleasant uh, task. Uh, just unringing the bell in the house was bad enough. My wife, uh, you know, one day just came home and said, uh, Honey, <coughs> how do you put the cork back into champagne? Because <laughs> they're not gonna, we're not going to, uh, you know, here's the thing about that real quick. Look, that happened to, ha that occurred. That occurred about two and a half years. That, well, let me see, January of last, around ja January of last year, 2015, January. Right around the time that happened, my book was more important. Does that make any sense? When I say, does that make any sense, I'm stealing that from Steve Pilch. He says that a lot. He'll say something, he'll say, does that make any sense? It's a Pilchism. I like it. <laughs> does that make any sense? Seriously. You can't make everything important. TV show sounds more important. But a book is more important. A book is forever. And a TV show, as you know, is for three seasons. If you're like really, really, you know, like, like I think Blackish may be on his last legs. I don't know. I, I don't know. God forbid. But you know, how long could you possibly go with that? Books are permanent. And my book is breathing new life into the impact that Dorothy Armstrong had on this world. My book is giving new life to my brother, Billy. He lived here for 13 years. Now he has a chance to be immortalized. A book has a dedication to people who, who, are, who are permanently important in this world. I mean, Crystal's just my wife, just one woman and one man, but she deserves that kind of recognition that she gets in that book. And you can't get that from television. And listen, by the way, I would love to be on television. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Paul, if you know something, I mean, help a brother out. I mean, Paul's a very connected guy. I mean, come on. Please, are you kidding me? I'd be fantastic at it. I was actually on TV, I was trying to act. I was, on the, I was in a commercial. I was in a commercial. I was on a show called Super Ninjas. I was playing the truck driver. Uh, that's my day job. That's my day job, and I'm sticking with it. It was fun, but that's not my thing. That's not my thing. And, and that, that's it? That's it. All right. Thank you, guys. I love you guys. <laughs>